doctor, engineer, architect, uh, Pavla Melkova, um, who joins us today from Prague and who is on the faculty of architecture at the Czech Technical University. Um, she is one of the most prominent architects in, um, uh, in uh, the Czech Republic and has done a tremendous amount of work in historically charged places, um, bringing new design and new thinking to those places to reactivate them and give them new relevance in contemporary society. She also received a Fulbright Fellowship uh, here uh, at Columbia University, uh, to come here to Columbia University. And we had the pleasure of having her amongst us uh, for some time. Uh, and so we are in a sense welcoming her back uh, virtually. Um, she's, she also has a thriving um, practice as a theorist and as a writer, uh, as an artist, uh, and obviously as a teacher. She's written many books, among them Experiencing Architecture in 2013, The Humanistic Role of Architecture in 2016, uh, a very interesting and exciting book about architecture of reciprocity, which was just published um, this year. And also this year, a book that uh, brings together the work that uh, she and her office did uh, at the Memorial for Jan uh, Palach in uh, Shestati. Uh, this is a really interesting project, which I hope she will show us today. With Miroslav Shikan, she is a partner in the studio MCA Atelier. Uh, and in 2012, she founded the Office for Public Space at the Institute for Planning and Development of the City of Prague, which she headed up until 2017. So she has both, uh, she is a polymath. She has a career that spans both professional practice, theoretical writing, aesthetic experimentation, and government work. Um, she has been recognized with a number of international and national prizes, such as the Architect Grand Prix in 2012, the first prize in the East Centric Architects Award competition in 2013, and she's been nominated for the European Union Prize for Contemporary Architecture, the Mies van der Rohe Award uh, in 2013 and 2020. So it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Historic Preservation Program Lecture Series. Pavla, thank you very much for being with us. And please take it away. We're, okay, we're... Thank, you very, thank you very much for invitation, uh, introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all uh, very much for being here and taking time. And thank uh, for the opportunity to give a lecture here at Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, a school to which uh, I have close personal relationship. And I'm very sorry that due to the pandemic, I can't do it in person as originally planned, but only online. Uh, so I'll try to share uh, my, uh, my presentation. Okay. Here. Yes, so here we are. Uh, the topic uh, I would like to introduce to you today uh, follows the experimental preservation platform, which was founded on GSAPP and is led by Jorge Torpailos. And when I spent a semester here a few years ago, as part of a scientific Fulbright scholarship, I carefully studied its activities. And its approach, which is based on openness, uh, willingness to seek and reevaluate, as well as the complexity of thinking, I consider extremely important today, not only in architecture. Therefore, I would like to introduce you to one of the methods of fulfilling the goals of experimental monument care, which is the involvement of monuments in contemporary life. We can call this method communicative uh, monument, and I will show it both on a general theoretical level and on practical examples of the realization of the Prague Architectural Studio MCA Atelier, 
which we lead together with my colleague architect Mirek Sikan. Presence as a creative component of memory. Uh, the foundation for the protection of monuments lies in the retention of their culture value, primarily in the retention of their physical essence, which is the bearer of culture meaning and its intellectual content. Yet it and of itself, this retention never suffices. Equally, it is necessary to connect the monument fully to present day life and actively develop its cultural meaning further as an added value for today. Before we turn to the methods of how it could be well helpful to ask why. Why in fact is it necessary to protect, revive and develop monuments? The monument is memory. The physical substance of the monument is the bearer of mind-based memory. Memory forms an inseparable part of the continuity of life for an individual or for society, the conjoined lines between past, present, and future. If we view the world as a whole, linked by contexts between individual cases and not as a mere heap of sections built together but without any connections to one another, whether in space or time, then the key to its comprehension lies in these coherences, these relations. And memory is a type of relation in seeking a connection in time and its adjoining space. Memory is irreplaceable. The greater part of society today doesn't and doesn't not wish to look into the future, particularly for the long term. That is the future that is part of the trajectory of humanity's of lifespan, whether viewed as a poorly linear or as cyclical. And it seems shortening our view into the future seems likewise to shorten our view into the past or vice versa. Indeed, almost an inability to see or a truncation, conscious or unconscious, at both ends. And not seeking, uh, in the not seeing in the mind is transferred into not reflecting in our actions, where we lack responsibility towards the future. If the protection, revitalizing and development of monuments aids in our becoming aware of this trajectory between the past, the present and the future, as much as our roles in each stage, then it is at the very least one of the reasons why to examine it. Perhaps we could even say all the more important in the present moment, full of short-sightedness, fragmentation, egocentrism, superficiality. If the present is part of this trajectory between past and future, then its task is not only to convey the past into the future, in which case it would de facto become merely a crossing of this crack of emptiness, but also to create a permanent trajectory itself. This means that we cannot merely shift memory passively, but must continually form its active part. On the level of human existence, of course, it happens even automatically, even by means of our existence itself, which cannot avoid leaving traces, whether good or ill. In this lecture, though, we are discussing the level of culture memory, which requires active and conscious participation. What then does it mean to be an active part of culture memory? rather than its passive transmitter? And what are the possibilities for such activity in the area of architecture monuments, whether institutionally protected or others, that bear valuable memory? Active and holistic heritage protection. The final purpose of an architecture monument is not merely its existence, in and of itself, but equally how its value acts on an individual or society, 
how it will influence life in a city and the people within it. This influencing contains two essential levels. One, the contents of what the appearance and functioning of the environment in which it or they happen to be. Such a consumption of the monument requires a no less complex understanding of how to protect it. It could be characterized on one hand by an active approach and on another by a holistic one, which sees the goal of monument protection not only in the retention of the matter as the most basic level, but also in its revitalizing, its connection to current affairs, developing and heightening its quality and supplementing it with contemporary layers as an inseparable necessity in the sense of the continual being of the monument. Monument protection, in other words, is viewed as active creation. Transmitting information about the past to the present. One of the possible ways of implementing an approach, both holistic and active, emerges from the actual meaning of a monument. That means the transmission of information about the past to the present and the future. If we speak about the protection of architectonic and artistic monuments, then this information will primarily bear a historic and cultural character. The active conception of protection means to find this information, identify its bearers, protect it, evaluate, revive, develop, elevate it, and find a method of how to communicate it on individual or social levels. As such, we could therefore speak of a communicative monument and precisely the method through which we make the monument a communicative monument is, with, is what I hope to address an approach that matches the holistic and active conceptions of heritage protection, for example, in response to the ideas from experimental preservation, particularly in understanding the protection of the monument, monument as a creative act, not merely the retention of a cultural layer inserted by the past in creating yet a third layer of today. As such, the complexity of monument of heritage protection is increased by a further significant dimension. The communicative monument. Protecting the monument is not enough. We need to bring it to speech. How do, do we make a monument speak? How do we interpret the intellectual contents saved within the monument? How do we make it part of a conversation with the present? As such, we now arrive at the qualities of communication in general. The basic goals are similar whether we consider communication between people or communication between people and their physical environment. Yet since in the context of a physical environment, it is harder for us to imagine the speech. Let us first examine it as if simply looking at communication on the interpersonal plane. And by posing the most elementary questions, what is the importance of mutual communication for people? What tools does human speech employ? What are its specific qualities? Communication is a type of relationship, de facto a form of touch. It is the in touch, in initiation of a relationship between person and person, person and society, person and living environment. It is no accident that in certain languages, for instance, Czech, a derivate, derivative of the Latin communicatio is used both for a roadway and for a connection. 
a means of understanding what creates sociability of individuality or individualities, a form of copying. Interpersonal speech is conveyed through the body, gesture, voice, written word, visuality, and so on. It's explicit or abstract, comprehensible or incomprehensible, open or hidden, fruitful or mendacious, quiet or loud, dominant or submissive, opulent or economical, full or empty, deep or superficial. And similar meaningful ramifications and qualities could be found in the language of the architecture and thus the language of monuments. Only their implements differ. The language of architecture. A form of language, just as in person-to-person -person communication, forms the method that a monument or architecture in general relates to the individual, the society, the environment. The basic functionality of language is understanding. Hence, it is necessary for the language of architecture speech to develop out of the language that we as people first encounter and perceive. The language of architecture speech, the language of its perception by human subjects, and the creation of architecture itself are all one and the same. Communication could be inserted into the forms of architecture itself or attached as an extra explicatory layer, text, image, another object, or many further ways. The basic communication of architecture transpires in the utilitarian plane, organizing our movement or stasis within space. Go this way, sit down here, stop, grab here with your hands, look over here, walk on through, turn aside, turn away, lean against this, put your hand down, take a seat, enter, bend down, descend, go another way, cross this, pass through, turn around, stand still, jump over, reach out, open, lie down, rise up, lift, slide, look, keep your eyes on this, turn your eyes away, look up, cast your gaze downward. And then, in turn, there exist further layers of architecture speech that we could call an enriching, where architecture can address our senses, our souls, our minds, deepening our perceptions, feeling, experiencing, comprehending of space itself and the environment itself and ourselves within them. Architecture can speak on the conceptual or the non-conceptual levels. Though, of course, one can never chart out a precise boundary between the two realms, and often they overlap. In the conceptual level, it represents the reality which can be grasped empirically and rationally and transformed into a conceptual language. In extra-conceptual, there is no representation but instead the creation of an immersive space, grasping at our senses and perceived through feelings. The language of both could be explicit or implicit, narrative or abstract, even though the explicit and the narrative usually correspond more to the conceptual level and the implicit and abstract to that of the extra conceptual. An explicit and narrative language works within literal meaning. We understand it on the level of habits and social conventions as much as in the case of a language spoken, written, or signed, which is merely the agreement of the assignment of a certain concept to a certain thing. A window appears like a window, a door a door, a table a table. An implicit and abstract language speaks in turn, perhaps through associations, metaphors, symbols, or conversely, 
even the elementary language of the structure of space or material. Even though the language of architecture is predominantly grasped through the visual, we should never forget that it could act through other senses, hearing, smell, touch, and kinesthetics. How to awaken speech in a monument. Here as well, we may draw upon human language for our ad to ask, how do we bring a person to speech? How to awaken speech in a person who is silent because the words are forgotten, the contents hidden deep in the psyche, the voice is long unused, the body is infirm, society has cast aside. How to raise up from the depths of a person or a building the lost, the rust eaten words? How to manifest the images of the past? How to bind the severed threads of scattered memories into coherence? And the answer, to show interest, to help, to ask, to understand, to find the right themes, to offer words, to forge a link with present life. In the case of a built monument, this implies finding the original language, protecting it and renewing it, reading the communication of its message, all the layers and contexts, finding the relationship of the message to the present, understanding the role of the monument in the tale of the past, and finding for it a role in the tale of the present. Creating the contents of a dialogue with the present, giving a shape to the language of its dialogue, inserting it into present life. Every monument is different. It is as much of an individual as any person. And every story is itself different every dialogue different. And yet, as much as any person, it forms part of a sociability in which the language of understanding lies within the very essence of its existence. Making monuments speak as part of their active and holistic protection, as a means for their connection to the life of the present and the generation of new cultural layers, is not a universal method. It is more of a creative approach where general principles and tools can be brought to bear upon concrete situations. And the best way of formulating it is through investigation of concrete instances. The following realizations of MCA Atelier display the various possible forms of its approach. As we have ourselves, together with Miroslav Sikan, applied it in our work. The first of them is Jan Palach Memorial in Všetaty. The house where Jan Palach was born is not an institutionally protected monument. Its physical matter bears little historical or artistic value. And since the time, when the Palach family occupied the structure, it was subject to wide-ranging changes in its exterior appearance and interior layout. Yet without question, its intellectual message is a strong monument, if not one necessarily protected. The house, respectively the place, is the material trace of the framework of a narrative where the end and the further beginning is Jan's demonstrative self-immolation in protest at the political and social situation in Czechoslovakia after the Warsaw Pact military occupation in August 1968. The goal of this extreme sacrifice was to awaken civic society from its passivity 
to undertake active resistance to the lack of freedom for the nation and its citizens. Over time, the figure of Jan Palach became for the Czech and Slovak people a timeless symbol of the struggle for freedom and ethical values. As such, the goal behind the revitalization was strengthening the role of the place as a recollection of Palach's death and its significance for history as well as the present. As form and function, the typology chosen was that of the memorial. In other words, the architectonic category where the chief mission is in fact communication. Hence, communicability came to form part of the work's very being. The basis of the meaningful communication didn't require much searching here. The legacy was Palach's death itself. But the question then arose, what are the various layers of this communication? What are its contexts? What is the meaning, its meaning for the present? And what meaning belongs to the universal timeless level? And finally, through what language created out of the original and the new should transmit all the layers and contexts of its communicated message. Even before the transformation into a memorial, the house spoke on its own, the ordinary language of a former home using the language of the quotidian backdrops of everyday life. But considering the condition of the house, repeatedly rebuilt and now decrepit, there were few words left over. The meaningful sense of the new language of the memorial is transmitting to its visitors the message of Palach sacrifice. Here, the importance lay in the engagement of the people affected similarly in the goal of the memorial not only to inform the visitors, but to address their engagement. Engagement through perceiving, experiencing, feeling, understanding, comprehending. As the central axis, we chose the layer of communication that points to the family background and the personal everyday level of Jan's life. Thus equally the layer that indicates the widest meaning of Palak's death and its importance for today. The new form of the memorial is where two characters of language intersect. Informative language acting on the rational level and the language of senses, feelings, emotions, spirits. The first character is presented by the information and objects displayed in the historical exhibition in the new museum pavilion, speaking via historic texts, exhibition items, historic photographs, film clips, and so on. The second speaks through the new aesthetic architectonic form from of form of the memorial, metaphors, symbols, associations, yet equally archetypal or subconscious impressions. The new language has linked up with the original one in dialogue and in harmony. The language of the memorial symbolizes the situation in which a sharp edge intervened in national life and the challenge it provoked. It stimulates us to listen to the challenges of today and our personal reactions to them. The visitors passes through the symbols thus inserted into the architectonic and artistic layer. 14 symbols, 14 halts, like the stations of the cross. The sharp edge of evil sliced into the house from outside, attacking home, family, the inner life. 
we enter the house through inside the edge and become part of the fracture situation. From the Peta forecourt, we enter the main space of the house, emptied by the strike of the edge of evil. The blinded windows lie at the boundary between the individual stance and response of society. The sharp edge of evil was blocked by the strength, strength of the home and the life sacrifice, the table that kept the edge of evil at the bay forms an homage to the family and to the mother. The blinded windows are the interface between a personal stance and the approach of the wider society. The cracks provide a Judas window for surveillance from the outside, yet simultaneously the hope of sunlight entering within. A fragment of staircase leads upwards to Jan's now vanished room. The room for reflection in the back of the main space is the place for the artistic response to the challenge by contemporary authors. The door to the house Jan had left last is now and forever only a door for departure. Into the heart of this space of reflection, we enter through a corridor where the sailing is covered by the Czechoslovak flag at the same position as the body of Jan Palach, which was covered by it, the sudarium of the body. The garden center is a point of intersection binding the situation of the memorial into a single unit of space and meaning. In the garden's corner, it appears another new house might be standing, but instead it is a limited section of the surrounding space. Inside, present in our current era, we observe the past. The once enclosed courtyard now opens freely into the space of the town, a meaningful gesture of the presence. The monument has become a public space. For the architecture and the site to speak fully, it was necessary to stand on the side of the listener. In this case, both the society and the individual facing this difficult and discomfiting message to extract it from the depths of a gradual forgetting, to find for it words strong enough to match its own strength. The second one from three I would like to show you is the house in Horní Světla. The house in Horní Světla is a part of an institutionally protected landscape area where the subject of protection is predominantly the house position in the character of the wider whole. The earliest cells are baroque, the wood and stone core is of 18th century vintage. The brick addition dates from the first part of the 20th, 20th century and small additions from the same era later part. All layers are the traces of stories, starting with the building's purpose in each given era and ending with the fates of its inhabitants. The aim of the last restoration was to save the house, more precisely to lengthen its lifespan through reinforcing its sustainability into the future. Through the revitalization of its structural and technical condition 
and no less through the creation of a new role for the house in human lives. A building intended as a residence is, in terms of the meaning and the language of its communication, a different type of structure than, a, than for example, public building or the highly specific form of monument. What, in short, is the intellectual message of a building intended as a residence? What can it communicate? To the same extent, it communicates with its inhabitants as well as the other people in its vicinity, in the village, the landscape. For the inhabitants, the house is a life partner. It is a being that follows them through the life of day-to-day -day utility as much as any spiritual of emotional experiences. The touches are physical through gaze or thought, and each touch is a form of relationship, hence no less of language. The original language speaks of layers of time, of contiguity with the surrounding landscape of the ever-present force of nature. And the new language draws upon this, developing it into multi-voiced polyphony. Words are given through materiality in the form of the tactility of individual materials, the way that the house interacts with the natural surroundings through light, shade, human touch, traces of time slayers, dialogues of old and new structures. We perceive the embrace of the rounded wooden handles in our hands. A bad foot reads the coarseness of the pebbles in the concrete surface, the joints of the thread worn floorboards, and the transition to the smooth surfaces of the new wood floors the back leaned against the exposed stone wall. Ascending the stars, stairs, we experience a view through verticality, the meadow, the forest, the sky. Opening the house doors toward the village, we experience wonder when behind the ordinary facet of the old house, there suddenly resounds a dialogue of old and new, as much as the sudden link to the open landscape through the all glass doors at the other end. The house gained its speech when we liberated it, when we relieved it of the burden of its enclosing structural layer of the most recent period from the blinding surfaces of paint and the suffocating deposits of objects. We opened its body towards the free flowing landscape, connecting spaces to free up their conversations, uncovering the pores in the beams, floorboards, stones, allowing them to breathe, letting in the warmth of the sun, color of the landscape, and as well, new life. And the last one I would like to show is the Bastion of the Crucifixions, which is a protected heritage site. A trace of Prague's historic fortifications with great significance in the structuring of the urban organism, informing the character of the site, in providing authenticity, authenticity of detail. The goal of revitalization here was, for one, to open up the public along an accessible part of the urban center and transform it into a public space and for another to preserve valuable historic remnants and conjoin them into culture and life. 
The intellectual message of the site is the representation of historic moments in Prague's history and the nations, the international political situation of medieval Europe, yet equally the urban expansion of Prague under Emperor Charles IV, representing the culture ideals of this age. The preserved original language, a field of fragments, remnants of words and sentences, yet within each one, a concentration of strength, of meanings, of secrets. The new language is grounded primarily in associations, spatial and meaningful associations or the natural qualities of the materials and the surroundings. The speech seeks out the lost contexts and creates new ones. It anchors the site in a network of original paths in the symbolic connection of visible urban landmarks and its structure of meanings and culture. The spaces of the supplementary structures are inserted against time's course into the accretions of the earth, like archaeology against time. The below ground atrium is a sunken negative of the tower we know to have stood in the area, but whose precise location is unknown. The rusty steel of the outdoor objects of the parterre recalls the rusting relics of wartime objects strewn across the battlefields of past ages. The black carpet on the ceiling is a kind of man-made moss below the ground in the spirit of defensive architecture where the heart is on the surface and the soft inside. The gratings of the main room evoke restraint, the dignity of a stone cave, while the colors seeping out of the rare below ground spaces are the colors of old walls, rust orange, purple gneiss, green moss. The space makes present the boundary between below and above, between light and dark, earth and emptiness. The site comes to speak through its accessibility to human presence. After decades of isolation, it has begun once more to relate its long and short tales about how it was touched by the nation's most vital historic moments. The essential skeleton of setting and meanings has risen to the surface, the revitalized materials are flourishing with constructions and colors. The new additions create associations with the history and the spatial context of the site. Speech creates relationship. Wherever there is language, there is conversation. Wherever there is conversation, there emerges a relationship. And in an active relationship, meaning is formed. In the present conversation of a monument with individuals and society, there emerges a new active cultural layer of the present time, connected to the layers of the past, incurring the monument as a living component of the trajectory between the past and the future. And herein, there lies the sense of bringing a monument to speak as part of its protection. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Pavla, that was terrific. Thank you so much. I um, am going to do the clapping for everyone else because <laughs> you know, Zoom does not allow us for 
the kind of active relationship that is usually allowed for in a regular uh, in face uh, face to face um, conversation. So um, we are going to try to bring the audience to speech at one point. Uh, so those of us that are online, you're more than welcome to please um, turn on your um, uh, um, uh, cameras. And I have, I have to now find oops, where you are because I've lost the I've lost my uh, my Zoom, unfortunately, right at the wrong moment. Pavla, are you still there? Can you hear me? I'm still here. I okay. hear you. I I have I've hang on because I have I, I see what happened. Okay, sorry, I lost the screen for a second. Um, so just a little housekeeping. So those of you that are on the uh, in the audience, I'd like to open it up for questions. There is. A, uh, I'm going to ask a few questions first, just to get the conversation started. Uh, we have about half an hour for Q and A, uh, and then I'm going to, uh, you know, call on people in the audience uh, to have their questions or comments. I'm going to ask you to please um, raise your hand using your um, using the screen. So if you click on your, if you hover your a mouse over your own image. There are three. Um, there should be a way for you to raise your hand. If you click down at where it says participants and you find your name, um, you should be able to raise your hand. It says more and then you should be able to uh, raise your hand. And perhaps, Meredith, you can give instructions on how to do that for those that, that don't know how to use the raise hand function on Zoom. Um, so please uh, do that and then I will I will call on anyone who has um, some, some questions. Um, you can also write those questions in the chat. Uh, and if you do that, then I can also scroll through them and um, and bring those uh, call on you to read them or bring them to the attention of Pavla. So Pavla, turning back to your talk, um, thanks again for a, a magnificent presentation. It's first of all very impressive to see the level of um, work and the breadth of work that you have done uh, with historic sites and your commitment to um, to an active and creative relationship to these to these heritage. Uh, sites. Um, I think I'm very impressed by your um, development through your practice of a, a theoretical framework for uh, both explaining what you're doing, but also giving us clues about how to do it, how to create um, meaning, to bring the meaning of the place forward but to 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 be an active participant as a designer in that conversation and i think you really foregrounded this this notion uh of of um uh of that creative act being central to the act of preservation uh and so i wanted to talk a little bit more about that because i think for um, many uh, preservationists, the idea of creativity is one that is considered to be um, something that should not show, right? That the, pre that the preservationist work should be invisible. It should not, uh, be, um, un should not be visually expressible and that the whole point of preservation is to, in a sense, keep that um, keep that uh, the present from showing in the in the in the monument and you took a very active stance against that in your talk um, uh, and you made the claim which I thought I wanted you to expand upon that to do that to not recognize our relationship in the present to the monument is in a sense, to do a disservice to preservation. 
uh, you said preservation is not merely a crossing. It's not merely just taking something and moving it on uh, from the past to the present, but mm -hmm. it is to take a, a, an active part in shaping and reshaping uh, cultural memory in an active part in influencing contemporary life. Yeah. And so that places a lot of pressure on you as a designer and a preservationist to take a stance. You, you have to take a position vis-a-vis -vis contemporary life, um, which can many, in many ways be political. I mean, you, 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 because uh, life is political. Uh, and so I, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, that because um, when you are talking about the kinds of um, lessons, the kind of speech that you're bringing into a monument, these are national monuments, many of them, these are national shrines. Um, they're speaking to a public that is um, that is trying that that is going to approach these as politicized monuments. You no, know, they have a role to play in contemporary politics, and I, I, but I sense in your work that you're trying to also move beyond politics to some extent to try to reach a kind of emotion that is. Um, uh, that transcends politics. It's an emotion, of, for example, the big wedge that you drive into the Jan Palach home is one about um, this sense of, 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 of something from the outside coming, you called it evil even, you use the word evil to describe that wedge, um, that you, you know, how do you stop something evil in the world? Um, and you, talked about the family as, a, as the kind of place where that stops. And you wanted to give that representation. So I just wanted to have you talk a little bit more about that, you know, the, 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 the kind of opposition that you seem to be placing between the kind of political sphere, the public sphere, and the private sphere of, of the family or of, of even in the individual that there that there's a private sphere and your monuments your the, your creative work in your monuments seem to try to make room for that private sphere within the public that the individual is not lost entirely in the public uh, realm when they enter the public realm they're not subsumed by the public realm but I wanted to hear more about that um, from you um, in terms of your, you know, your thoughts on that. I mean, the, your thoughts on the relationship between the individual and the public. Do you see politics being only in the public sphere or is the individual that you are, that your monuments speak to, I think they're speaking to, but I'm not sure, you, you, you tell me, is, is, the, is the individual also political? Are these two kind of politics that, you're, that your monuments are trying to negotiate between? Or do you always feel that you're addressing just the individual or just the public kind of as an abstraction? Okay. Uh, you are true that um, this uh, this speech we just uh, we as an architect we, who are dealing with monuments uh, and when we are active, uh, it's really could be manipulative. We could manipulate it, but uh, I think uh, if we are talking uh, about our role as uh, as uh, as we could uh, make the monument bring to speech it, uh, so on on one side we have to interpret something which we have to uh, find uh, in this monument. Yeah, we we. I think our task is to first to listen very carefully, uh, to try to understand 
what this monument, the content, the ideal content of this monument is really wanted to say it's uh, we are indifferent in this situation. Yeah, we only have to uh, translate uh, as as best way uh, we are able to do it. And uh, the second part of it, uh, it could be a dialogue yeah, uh, from the past and present and future. And I think that we have to be through in it. Yeah? And if we are through, it's, it is not manipulative. Yeah? We, we could say now we are in some situation present and we want to uh, make a dialogue between past and our task is to find really clear uh, language of the past and uh, and make it uh, visible uh, on the on the monument yeah and uh, if you ask about the role uh, between individual and uh, society uh, in politics i think that uh, this example of uh, jan palach memorial it's a good example because uh, it was a young uh, reaction to politics uh, and society situation and what we wanted was to show people, all the visitors who come uh, to the memorial, uh, to be able to feel, to understand that uh, there is their own task, that is a challenge. Uh, in, in these times, it was a challenge for Jan Palach. He had this challenge, he, he wanted to do something as a person, he wasn't able to be part of some politic uh, movements and so on. So he had the only uh, chance to react uh, individually. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, what we wanted uh, to say through this monument was that uh, uh, not only in this very hard period of our history, but also Today, there are many, many, uh, maybe small, uh, but many other uh, types of evil. So there are many uh, small challenges around us and each of us could and is able to react to them if we are listening to them. Yeah? So uh, I think it's possible uh, through uh, the individual act in some historical point to generate it and show that it has uh, it has uh, validity, general validity. So it has validity also for our present, maybe in more abstract uh, level and also in future. And what we wanted was not only to show uh, real uh, dates and information about this history uh, situation, but more to show the general level in it, which is valid for our presence and for all individuals we are uh, dealing with the situations. One of the things I really enjoyed about your talk also was your description, your very careful description of communication as a relationship and that it is not only uh, a logocentric uh, act, but in other words, it's not dependent on simply words or speech or text, but that the body also is involved in communication. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, the kind of work that you do as, a, uh, as an architect dealing with historic sites, dealing with a very abstract art, which is architecture, um, is to, in a sense, create these bodily relationships in a carefully orchestrated way to establish an interaction between the visitor's body and the heritage that they are inhabiting in a very particular orchestration that will, that will create a kind of dialogue. So you're, but in a way, what I really took away was this notion that the heritage is, is also gesturing through your work to the visitor, trying to engage the visitor in different acts, to look, to sit, to pause, to move, right? To, to be in a space in a particular way. 
And hmm. I want to ask you a little bit about this orchestration. Do you, um, do you in your working method, do you work with a, with a large group of people? Like, a, you know, you sit down with a community and you ask them, you know, to, to uh, tell you about the kinds of relationships or, 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 or uh, values that they understand to be present or underrepresented at the site? Or do you work with historians to try to understand that? Um, do you work alone? Do you work, you know, how do you engage um, other people in the act of redesigning these, these sites? You know, do, or do you, or do you most, you know, you get the brief and then you work alone in the studio and then do the work? Um, how, or is it different in different sites? You know, tell us a little bit about that process. Uh, I think that both approaches are present in our work. Uh, it depends uh, sometimes what we are, because uh, we are not working especially on uh, historic preservations. We are also working on uh, many other types of public buildings and and uh, other and also public spaces very often. So if we are working, for example, on public spaces, which is uh, uh, often uh, revitalization of old public spaces where people uh, still uh, are living. So uh, our communication, I think it's not about uh, to ask them, how do you imagine this? How do you want uh, it uh, uh, to, uh, to will look like? Yeah. But we, uh, at the beginning, uh, we always ask uh, questions like, uh, how do you feel here? Uh, what do you want to uh, do here uh, in future? Uh, are you afraid of something here? So uh, we, we asked uh, for us to imagine uh, about acting in the space, not about visibility of space or architecture or design form of it because uh, this, uh, uh, this awareness of what we want uh, people could do there in future, uh, the revitalization, it is our, uh, our starting point. And after it, we only start to form uh, uh, forms of architecture or design. So, and... Uh, the other approach uh, is maybe uh, when we are in a little bit more artistic level, as for example, this memorial of Jan Palach. Uh, I don't think uh, in these situations it could help so much this participation, white participation with people. I think uh, in this situation is more uh, through you as an artist, through your feelings, through uh, your very, very inside uh, feelings and inside imagination because in this situation you are more an artist than a public uh, uh, creator of a public uh, space and maybe what is interesting i think uh, uh, you asked also uh, we talked also about language and I think in this uh, communication with people, it is very important for me personally, and it's a long, uh, long uh, years uh, topic of my research and my thinking and my uh, my writing these books and texts, is that uh, I think that uh, if we want to find language uh, as an architect uh, to put uh, in architecture, for architecture to speak with people itself. So first, I think we have to understand language, which people understand environment around them, to understand really language of their feelings, the language of the picture uh, of surrounding environment they have in head this, this picture of this feeling, the picture of this of this perceiving the, the environment. So I think this is maybe a kind of participation with people. And uh, 
uh, we are not doing it uh, uh, through this concrete project. I think uh, as an architect, you have to do it your whole life to, to try to understand the way, the language, how people uh, understand surrounding environment, so architecture, so monument, and so on. So uh, if you, if you uh, understand a little bit this kind of language, I think then, as for example, in this memory of Anne Palach, uh, you could work with it uh, abstractly. You could uh, translate uh, these this forms of language into the speech of some abstract art, architecture, and so on. So uh, then, for example, when we use this abstract language as uh, in the memory of Jan Palach uh, in Šetaty, uh, then it is about immersive art, yeah. The the so so I I could uh, could uh, show it on the on the example uh, in art, yeah. You you could have representative art when uh, the artistic object represents something. It's and this representation is outside you, yeah, outside you. And uh, when uh, you want to do what we are doing, for example, in this memorial is to make something immersive. So this communication is not outside you, but is becoming through your perceiving. So uh, you don't see some representation, some representations in these objects uh, and architecture, but you have to create these communications through your perceiving like immersive, uh, like immersive art, like immersive objects. So this is the way we are trying to work. I think it's very powerful. You know, when we talk about uh, feelings and emotions, right? Um, we often talk about uh, in, order, in order to understand your feelings, you know, putting words to feelings, right? So when you're trying to, to deal with difficult feelings, uh, in psychology, uh, psychologists will talk about putting words to feeling. And I somehow think of your work as putting spaces to feelings, um, trying to express uh, a feeling spatially so that it, uh, that process helps to clarify it and helps to kind of reify it and be able to deal with it in a particular way because you're uh, you're dealing with very charged feelings. I mean, uh, Jan Palach burnt himself to death in order to protest the Soviet invasion. Um, so putting, putting spaces to feelings so that other people can kind of understand that seems to be a really interesting way of, of kind of dealing with the psychology of a place, the kind of emotional charge of a place. And uh, of course, these are not... Um, reductive in the sense that, you know, there are multiple feelings or, you know, multiple emotions that can be in, in the space. So you're not, you're not trying to kind of control it, but you're trying to clarify it and give it some sort of um, uh, uh, sharpness so that uh, it's easier. But I also feel that there's a real uh, generosity in your spaces because you, you welcome the kind of um, the, the visitors own experiences. It's you're not, uh, in a sense, um, trying to be dogmatic or or restrictive in the sense of what can be experienced in a particular space, but you're trying to uh, also welcome people's own memories and experiences at the space as a way of understanding the place, which is, um, to me, really uh, at the core of this idea of of bringing the monument. Uh, into a relevance today and giving it a future, giving it a, giving it a new relevance because it's it's a relevance yeah. in, in the people that come to the to the monument, and the and the experiences they take away. So I find that really powerful. We have a um, a question from Shuyi Yin who's r raised her hand. So Shuyi, you want to turn on your um, uh, camera and uh, ask your question, and and others, please, you know, do the same. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your uh, beautiful project and ideas. Um, and I think the idea of speech uh, is really fascinating to me. And I'm wondering, um, like, um, like, 
what exactly is this concept of idea, uh, like the speech here? Is it kind of like the, uh, like Arendtian, like political speech? And then um, it's kind of like creation of the communication by speech related to action. And then action can open up faculties, uh, potentiality and creation. But at the same time, action can also um, mean like startling unexpectedness. So I'm just wondering, um, like, how could we um, guarantee such ac action has like good result? Or, um, or in, in another sense, like, do you think speech is the only communicative way? Or, um, like, for example, how do you think of um, like the power of silence or some other um, some other ways? Because I mean, the silence is kind of uh, in opposite to speech. But then, like, is the speech the um, the only necessary way to create this kind of um, action towards uh, like um, a better society? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think uh, when we are uh, talking, uh, you ask uh, about the relationship uh, between communication and action. So uh, in old Greek, uh, they, they ever uh, said that uh, communication have to be before the action, yeah, which is something I believe uh, in very strongly. Uh, I think that uh, if you want to act, uh, 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 to be aware of what you are doing, it's one thing. You have to think about it before. And if you want to act uh, uh, as a part, uh, uh, to know uh, you have agreement uh, with the society, with people, as, as an architect, uh, if I I am doing something. I am doing it always for other people, not for me uh, itself. So for me, uh, this communication is necessary uh, to know that I have agreement with uh, these people, that, uh, that I know what to do. So uh, for me, action, it's better if action is after communication. Yeah. So this is this uh, this relationship and uh, silence. I think silence is uh, is break between <laughs> between communication. So it's uh, it's also one part of language. Sure, you are right. Thank you. Yeah, this question of action is a is a very interesting very interesting one. Um, so. I, I wanted to ask you about memory a little bit because a lot of what you your work has to do with memory and you're talking about um, a kind you know you're 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 dealing with sites that have a very important history um, and so and they and that history is interpreted at the site textually I imagine um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about about memory how do you how do you think of memory? Are you, uh, do you think of these sites as places of memory uh, in the sense of like uh, Pierre Nora's notion of, of uh, places of memory, lieu de mémoire, or do you think of these, in other words, collective memories that get, that get played out in these, in these places? Or do you think of these as places that are more for an individual memory um, of, do you see this as places to build memories or to ev to evoke memories? Uh, I'm thinking of the National Park Service in America, for example, right? The yeah. National Park Service has a mission to to make memories. It's you yeah. that's where you take your children when they're young to learn about the relationship to the environment, the relationship to American history. It is educational, but is also um, a kind of product placement. You know, you have a wonderful experience together as a family, and then as part of that experience is the national story. So um, I'm wondering that relationship, you know, do, is it, is this a, do you see these as places um, to build memories, to create memories that are 
imbricating personal memory into a national narrative? Um, or, or are these places where the national and the individual can be kept apart? Okay, it's a very, it's a very complex question, Jorge, <laughs> for a few last minutes. Um, no, no, I think uh, because uh, for me, uh, as an architect, the architectural environment is very important as a part of some existential question to yeah. For me, it's very important to be aware uh, how uh, it's important for people to be able to identify with uh, their surrounding environment, uh, to be aware of their role in it, which I think could help them uh, to understand their life itself. Yeah. And this way, I also, uh, I'm also thinking about uh, memory in monuments, I think, because this memory had as many levels. Yeah, it could be, um, it could be think about it uh, as information. This monument could be some educative object, which could uh, in physical, in physical essence, bring you some information about history, like book, like like uh, any other object, which is better of, of this uh, memory as information. But for me, it's also important this role of memory as a part, which could help people uh, better uh, identify with uh, the architecture, this object, uh, uh, this this place, uh, this town, uh, this uh, their home. So I think this, yeah. So for me, memory is uh, a part uh, of of the of the character of of this environment, which could help to to feel it, to understand it, and so on. Mm -hmm. As a language, or as a language. <laughs> um, any uh, anyone else in the audience? I want to make sure to uh, if there are any comments or questions that anybody would like to ask. Don't be shy. Okay, um, so uh, Pavla, it's um, it's such a pleasure to see your amazing amazing work. Uh, it's such an honor to be able to have you virtually here uh, with us in our in our uh, public lecture program. I want to thank you for sharing your ideas, sharing your theories, sharing your practice. Uh, and your original approach to to the preservation of of heritage, it's an inspiration to all of us and in a real lesson. So thank you so much. Jorge, thanks. Thank you very much for invitation. Everybody for taking time and be here, and also for interesting discussion. Thank you and bye. Wonderful.